support opioid abuse prevention and treatment. Today's presentation, speakers' bios, and resource documents can all be downloaded by clicking on the files located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. When each file is highlighted, click the Save to My Computer button. You can then save the files in a location of your choice. At the conclusion of the presentation, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions by both over the phone and online. The operator will provide you with instructions on how to submit questions over the phone, and you can type in questions you have throughout the presentation in the chat pod featured at the bottom of your screen. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope that you find the webinar helpful. I'll now turn the presentation over to Senior Behavioral Health Advisor, Alex Ross. Thanks, Carl, and welcome, everybody. Um, I first want to start by thanking my colleagues in the Bureau of Health Workforce here at HRSA for the terrific effort they put into organizing today's webinar. It's a very, very important and timely uh, topic. I do want to remind you, as Carl mentioned, that you can type questions in throughout the presentation, and we'll do our best to try to answer those questions. Um, we do have a time limitation on the webinar, so we may not get to all of them. Um, our focus today is on how to train the existing and future clinical workforce to address the challenges of opioid abuse. Um, the Bureau of Health Workforce is doing some innovative approaches that I think you're going to find really interesting to hear about from a series of uh, grantees on this call. Each of the speakers will have approximately 10 minutes, and we are doing our best to have a little time at the end of the sessions for Q&A but we'll hopefully have some time at the end of all the speaker presentations to do some of that uh, as well. I want to take just a moment to remind you who is presenting and their topics, and then I will be turning it over to our uh, welcome speaker, Dr. Luis Padilla, who's the Associate Administrator here in the Bureau of Health Work. So our first presenter will be Dr. Melinda Campapiano, who's the Senior Medical Advisor for the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, and her topic is Innovative Models and Resources to Support Opioid Prevention and Treatment. She'll be followed by Karen Peters and Judith Syad, both from the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health. Karen is the director of the Illinois AHEC uh, program, and Judith uh, is a program office staff in that particular AHEC. Their topic is practice-based lessons from the Illinois AHEC or the Area Health Education Center. They're going to be followed by Constance Van Egan. Uh, Dr. Van Egan's research and teaching and outreach are focused on patient-centered changes in healthcare organizations. She's an assistant professor at the University of Vermont, and her topic will be implementing opioid reduction policies in Vermont. After Connie, You'll be hearing from Suzanne Bailey and Mark McGraw, both of them from Cherokee Health Systems, a comprehensive health center doing integrated care in Tennessee. Suzanne is the Director of Integrated Services at Cherokee, and Mark is the Director of Addictions Medicine, also at Cherokee. And their topic is an integrated approach and recruitment strategies to combat the opioid epidemic. And finally, We'll hear from Helene Silverblatt. Helene is director of the New Mexico AHEC, located at the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center, and is also a professor of psychiatry, family, and community medicine at the university. Her topic, strategies to combat the opioid epidemic in New Mexico. It's my pleasure to introduce our welcoming speaker, Dr. Luis Padilla. Luis is the associate administrator for Health Workforce here at HRSA, and he also serves as director of the National Health Service Corps program. With an annual appropriation of more than $1 billion, the Bureau administers over 40 workforce programs. A pleasure to introduce Dr. Padilla. Thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you, everyone uh, who's joined us for this webinar. And, and before I begin, I'd just like to thank our staff at uh, Bureau of Health Workforce for the hard work and Alex for their hard work in getting this webinar. We're very excited about this webinar series, and in particular this topic. And a big thank you to our presenters uh, for participating today. It's my pleasure to be here and welcome you to our inaugural uh, Grand Rounds webinar series, the first of which is focused on opioid abuse prevention and treatment. 
the Workforce Grand Rounds is a new pilot webinar series hosted by the Bureau of Health Workforce. Uh, the goal of this webinar series is to improve health professionals training with an intent to increase the number of high quality health professionals, particularly those uh, providing services in rural and underserved areas. In the coming months, we'll host experts and thought leaders to share evidence-based practices, innovative models, and promising approaches to enhance training for the future health workforce on a wide range of topics such as education pipeline, rural health, and oral health. Today's presentations will cover novel approaches to opioid addiction and treatment, team-based approaches, curricula, as well as policy development and implementation. We are grateful to collaborate with presenters from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and Cherokee Health Systems Incorporated, a federally qualified health center and community mental health center in Tennessee. In addition, we're looking forward to hearing from staff of the Area Health Education Centers, also known as our AHECs, in New Mexico, Illinois, and Vermont. AHECs are funded by our Bureau to support enhanced enhance access to high-quality, culturally competent health care through academic community partnerships. AHECs also serve the distribution, also help to improve the distribution, diversity, and supply of a primary care health workforce who serve in rural and underserved areas delivering high-quality health care. Opioid abuse is a serious public health issue. Drug overdose deaths are on the rise. Specifically, opioid-involved deaths claimed 33,000 lives in 2015. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, an estimated 91 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose. These statistics are alarming. To combat the nation's opioid crisis, the department has prioritized five strategies. First, strengthening public health surveillance. Advancing the practice of pain management. Third, improving access to treatment and recovery services. Fourth, targeting availability and distribution of overdose reversing drugs. And fifth, supporting cutting edge research. Last year, HRSA awarded 94 million, that's 271 health centers in 45 states, including the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, to improve substance abuse treatment and expand the delivery of substance abuse services in health centers, with a specific focus on treatment of opioid disorders in underserved populations. The aim of these awards were to increase the number of patients screened for substance use disorders and referred to treatment, increase access to medication-assisted treatment for opioid abuse and other substance use disorder treat, uh, treatments, and provide training and educational resources to aid healthcare professionals to make informed prescribing decisions. Along with this unique investment, HRSA will continue to seek your assistance to identify best practices, lessons learned, and key strategies that pro produce measurable results. Your partnership, now more than ever, is critical to us. As primary care providers in community-based settings, you are on the front lines and face great challenges. Before I close, know that the department is working to support clinically sound, effective, and efficient programs. We want to hear from you so that together we continue to turn the tide and prevent the loss of our, great, our country's greatest asset, its people. I hope you find the information in this webinar today helpful and a compliment to the great work that you're doing every day to address the opioid epidemic. Thank you for your collaboration and partnership as we move forward in this critical work together to help millions of Americans hurt by this public health crisis. And now I'll turn it back to Alex, our moderator for the session. Thanks very much, Dr. Padilla. And I'd like to start by turning this uh, webinar over to our colleague from SAMHSA, Dr. Melinda Campopiano. Melinda? So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning if you're on the West Coast or beyond. And it looks like I'm getting control of the slides right now. This is great, because I am just going to launch right in here to the information that I've prepared, um, which I hope will be useful for you. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the opioid epidemic. I think everybody is pretty aware that, that we have a significant problem. The one thing that I do want to highlight for you is that the recent increase in opioid death rates of about 15% is largely driven by illicit opioid use. This is important as we go through the material that I'm going to cover because it magnifies really the importance of naloxone and treatment concerns. I'm going to use this slide to highlight for you uh, the that most of these slides have a link on them to additional information. So this one has a link to the CDC site where you can get state-level uh, data on um, overdose uh, 
the most current being from 2015. So moving right along, I'm going to cover three of the five HHS priority areas, basically safe, uh, appropriate uh, opioid prescribing for pain, uh, increasing availability of naloxone, and increasing access to medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. So starting right in with opioid, uh, safe and appropriate opioid prescribing, uh, I think uh, the CDC guidelines have gotten a lot of attention, and they are a very useful tool if you're in a practice setting where you may be managing chronic pain. I do want to highlight, though, that to some extent the guidelines have been um, kind of uh, taken, a, they're meant to be a tool for clinicians to make decisions around individual patients. And in some cases they're becoming regulations, which was not their intent. So it's a useful tool, but should not be the measure of whether, whether one is providing good care. Um, the last uh, bullet on this slide, the Surgeon General's call to end the opioid epidemic, I want to highlight for you because it has really exceptional um, uh, resources. It's very well curated. Uh, so it has patient and provider resources uh, that you should find useful as you're trying to increase your population's awareness uh, of what your providers are doing around um, safer and more appropriate opioid prescribing. There are some training and publication resources uh, that SAMHSA has supported. Opioidprescribing.org is a joint uh, activity we have with the um, Boston University. I want to point it out to you because it has um, free continuing medical education for all levels of uh, providers. And it has a module on it for dentists, too, which um, I'm not aware of there being a lot of information out there for dental providers. You can also get a mentor um, and learn about prescribing for military service members. You can also learn about, um, there's a fantastic video module on um, how to clinically address unexpected uh, findings from the prescription drug monitoring program. Because I know a lot of uh, people are being required to check that and are checking it because it's good clinical practice, but they may feel a little um, uncertain about how to address it therapeutically in the clinical setting. Um, and then there's a couple of useful presentations for you. Um, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment is not new. But I do want to bring it up in this context, because when we're talking about prescribing opioids for pain, um, screening brief intervention is, and referral to treatment is important. A lot of emphasis has been placed on making sure that someone does not have opioid use disorder prior to prescribing a pain medication. But it's actually just as important to make sure that they don't have substance use disorder of any kind or perhaps hazardous or harmful alcohol use disorders, which will make opioid analgesics very unsafe. So I just wanted to kind of introduce you to the possibility that even if you're not attempting to uh, provide naloxone or introduce medication for treatment of addiction, that screening brief intervention referral to treatment ha has an important contribution to make in your uh, approach to safe and uh, appropriate um, prescribing. And then there is a curriculum that you can use uh, that's available through the ATTCs. And the ATTCs are the SAMHSA, roughly equivalent of the AHEX, just to give you an idea what those are. Um, now, screening brief intervention referral to treatment is also an important element to addressing uh, overdose prevention. You may not uh, discover somebody who has a diagnosable opioid use disorder, but you may some find someone who has some risky behavior. This would be a good opportunity to use the brief intervention period to provide with some educational messaging, such as don't use drugs alone, sample drugs from an unfamiliar source, and use by the safest means possible. This is also an opportunity to explain um, how to recognize an overdose, what to do if you think someone is overdosing, and provide a naloxone prescription. There will be a okay. curriculum out for you to use to train staff on this, um, hopefully in the summer, um, where our fingers are crossed. Well, now, we, ask that, uh, for the, we ask that the presenters, if you're not speaking, could you please mute your phone? Thank you. All right, so the, the tool that SAMHSA currently has available that you may find useful is our overdose prevention toolkit. And it has a 
five modules so that you don't have to give the whole thing to everybody. You can give one piece to a patient, one piece to your providers, another piece maybe for people who are have uh, friends or family at risk of overdose. It covers how to prescribe and use all the different forms of naloxone, uh, and it is available in Spanish. Now, down at the bottom here, there's a link, prescribetoprevent.org. I'm highlighting that one for you because it has an online module for pharmacists about prescribing um, uh, naloxone and how they can support pr providers or if they're in a situation where they're allowed to dispense naloxone, how they can go about that and what education they should be providing patients. So this is just the big perspective picture on uh, to sort of set the groundwork for talking about medication-assisted treatment. Um, we know that of the probably eight the 20 million people who meet criteria for a substance use disorder, only a little over 10% of them actually received treatment at a specialty facility. And there are lots of ways in which this, these figures, these statistics are somewhat limited, but, as you, but the point is that, that there's a big, big, big opportunity to move people in the direction of treatment, even if you don't provide it yourself. Uh, although hopefully as I go through the material here on medication for opioid use disorder, you might find that uh, it's worth considering doing it in your setting and with the workforce that you train. So um, I am not going to go into the pharmacology of uh, medications for opioid use disorder. Um, what I do want you to know in general about treatment is that detoxification is not treatment. And that, that will come as a surprise to some in your communities because that is very often what people look for first. But detoxification is considered the medical management of acute withdrawal. So it doesn't change the course of the underlying substance use disorder. All it does is manage the withdrawal from the substance. Um, detoxification should really not be undertaken unless it's paired with naltrexone. You could pair it with methadone or buprenorphine, but you don't have to detox somebody to start those. So you may want to consider skipping the detox step if you're considering one of those medications. I'm also just going to mention a SAMHSA resource that I forgot to put on this slide, which is uh, an online decision support tool called Decisions in Recovery. And it's primarily for patients who are trying to consider if they, if they need uh, medication for opioid use disorder and which one but it does have provider tools as well. So met methadone and buprenorphine are what we call opioid agonists, meaning they act like an opiate. So they are abusable, potentially. They are subject to regulation. They're a little bit different in how they operate, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Now, Trexone is the third agent that's FDA approved, and it is an antagonist or a blocking agent. It is not abusable, not subject to any regulatory control, and can be prescribed or administered by any type of um, prescriber, uh, prescriber at all. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about resources for each of these, but that's really all I'm going to say about the different medications. The next, well, look at that, fancy. Detoxification is not treatment, just in case you, meant, you missed it. Um, benefits of medication-assisted treatment. This is probably the most important slide in this set. Medication-assisted treatment, particularly with methadone or buprenorphine, reduces all-cause mortality for people who use with opioid use disorder. So it reduces overdose death. It reduces death from other causes. Um, the, the link on this slide is to a recently published meta-analysis that describes the um, life-saving benefit of medication-assisted treatment with these two drugs. Now, naltrexone, we don't have as much information about, but if a patient chooses naltrexone or if it's most suitable or most accessible to them, to the extent that it assures um, abstinence, we can infer that these benefits will also accrue to the patient who receives naltrexone. But the research data is primarily available for methadone and buprenorphine. So reduces all-cause mortality, reduces HIV risk by about half, improves adherence to other medical treatments. So if you're in a primary care setting, you'll see your diabetics and your hypertensive do better. 
improves social functioning, and that's important because we have parents and people who are caring for elderly relatives and people who need to work um, who have this condition, and decreases criminal behavior and decreases drug use. Um, just for your information, if you access the notes view of this slide, there are additional citations uh, down there that you can look at. Now, let's move on to um, resources quickly. Um, for naltrexone, SAMHSA has a publication that goes through the very basics, really everything you need to know to get started with naltrexone in a non-specialty setting. Um, this is a link to the document. And then we have our kind of central medication-assisted treatment training platform, which is PCSSMAT, Providers Clinical Support System for Medication-Assisted Treatment. And you can find training for providers at, at all levels on all of the medications or multiple medications or people with substance use disorder and pain and so on at that site. You'll see it appears here a few times over. That site also offers mentors uh, for people who might be new to providing medication for opioid use disorder. Now, uh, a similar publication that's on buprenorphine is our advisory. This is less than a year old. It covers all of the brand and generic uh, sublingual transmucosal formulations. It does not cover the new implant. We're still working on um, uh, how to introduce that through our publications. Um, you can find the required training uh, physicians are required eight hours, nurse practitioners and PAs are required 24 hours at the training location that I mentioned already, PCSSMAT, and it's, the training there is free. Um, if you want to find out how to get the waiver and what all is involved, there's another link that will take you to samhsa.gov slash medication-assisted treatment. Um, let's see. Now, methadone, as you probably know, requires uh, that a program be certified as an opiate treatment program. Um, this is somewhat more regulation, regulated for purposes of safety. Such a program can also provide buprenorphine and naltrexone, and we encourage them to provide all three. Um, the other thing you should know is that buprenorphine is subject to patient limits per provider. Buprenorphine provided through an opiate treatment program is not subject to these limits. So if you're struggling to meet uh, uh, demand for treatment in your community and you, and you have the administrative resources to operate as an opioid treatment program, this may be um, a good strategy for you. And there's links again here. So one sort of go-to all about medication for opioid use disorder um, resource is SAMHSA's MATX app. And I guess I should stop calling it new, but it hasn't been out for even a year yet. This one has not only uh, the pharmacology, the prescribing, how to become a prescriber, how to open an opiate treatment program. It also has um, some patient resources and some treatment guidelines and billing information that you may find uh, useful to have all in one place. So we recommend the free app. Um, I think we might be down to the last one. Now this is going to take me just a little minute to explain. This, this is a very late funding uh, opportunity announcement for SAMHSA. Normally we're not doing anything new this time of year. Uh, but this is the third cohort in our medication-assisted treatment, prescription drug, and opioid addiction uh, treatment capacity expansion grants. Um, the states that are listed here are the only ones eligible to apply this year. Um, the state is, does need to be the applicant. Usually this will be your single state authority. Um, and then, but they need to partner with a community provider. And you could be a provider who's looking to add medication-assisted treatment or who may be providing, say, naltrexone or buprenorphine, and you would like to add uh, behavioral health on site or case management or other services, uh, recovery support, so on. So it, it, it can be used to take care of both the medication piece and the other services that are needed for successful treatment. Um, deadline for the application is July 31st. The award is up to $2 million a year for up to three years. Um, and there's a link to the grant application here. Now, I'm pretty sure that's my last slide, which means it's time for me to hand it over to Karen and Judith from Illinois. 
Thank you for your attention. Hello, can... Hi, this is Judith Syed from uh, Illinois AHAC. Um, I hope Karen can, can come on and she wasn't sure that you would be able to hear her. But anyway, we would like to talk about what we've learned um, in Illinois and what we have been doing here uh, with our AHAC. Um, the a our AHAC was established in 2010. And, you know, we have a, c a consistent goal with all the other AHACs to improve health care for the underserved by increasing access to learning and professional development opportunities. And we're administered by the National Center for Rural Health Professions at the College of Medicine in Rockford. And we have sort of divided our program office so that we also have an um, urban office um, here at the School of Public Health and at the College of Medicine's Urban Medicine Program here on the Chicago campus. Um, this is just a map of um, our coverage areas. Um, so that you can see, you know, Illinois is kind of a funny shaped state, so people are covering a lot of different, you know, areas. Uh, the the um, stars are where the actual centers are located. Um, and we got into this very early on after we were funded. David Bingaman, who was then the uh, Region 5 HRSA administrator, um, hosted what he called the A-Team, and he invited all of these HRSA funded entities at UIC together to sort of like as a meet and greet and to discuss what we might want to do together. And um, it really was AHEC and ATTC and the AIDS Education Training Center that um, came together and continued to work together over, over time. This was right around the same time when Jeff Cody had been made um, Region 5 SAMHSA administrator, and he was also a at this meeting. And um, Jeff, uh, David has now retired, but Jeff and the rest of us have continued to um, collaborate. This slide just talks about what's going on in Illinois um, in terms of the opioid ep epidemic. We've seen great increases. Um, our rural areas have seen increases that look like typos on the slide, but you have to remember that in a rural area, if you go from one death to 17 deaths, that's a huge percent increase um, over those years. And we had already passed in Illinois the, um, the legislation that gave some immunity to uh, bystanders if they reported an overdose. But it was still on its insane upward trajectory. So in September of 2015, I don't know how many people are um, familiar in Illinois, but we don't really pass too much legislation right now. Um, we don't pass budgets. Um, but anyway. We did, this was the only, um, in, in 2015, the only piece of legislation that passed and was um, able to withstand our governor's veto. Um, and it was a, it's a very broad bill. It expands access, it broadens immunity, um, it requires um, addiction treatment to be covered. Uh, it strengthened the state uh, prescription monitoring program, which I'll talk about a little later, and it broadens access to drug courts, which is a, a major point that we'll discuss later. And it mandated training for drug court personnel. I mean, it does, did a million different things. But so that's like the landscape that we were working in. Um, and one of the programs that came out of this A team is this Integrated Community Behavioral Health Training Consortium that uh, started in 2012, has three universities um, and SAMHSA and a community agency. And it was really designed to help um, build the next generation of behavioral health professionals to be able to work interprofessionally and have a team-based vi vision of care. And it's cited with um, a community partner that works in the jail. So obviously the other thing was um, to reduce recidivism. We have a lot of issues at our jail which are not part of this um, conver conversation, but anybody who wants to um, contact me can. So we have three academic partners um, that are, participate in the consortium. 
two of these schools um, are minority serving universities. So that really helps in terms of wh what, who we attract in terms of students. And because um, at UIC, this is through the Illinois AHEC, we really um, open it up to all health science disciplines on campus and not on campus. So students from more than those three universities have been um, participating. And it really helps to have AHEC here as a way of facilitating um, participation across universities. And I need to give a shout out to Jeff Cody once again. He has provided conceptual guidance, uh, mentorship. I'm sure he's sometimes sick of listening to me. And he's really well respected by all the partners um, that are involved in this. Uh, and we also could not do this without our community partner. I mean, I know all, anyone who does community work understands the value of their partners. Task, this is um, a core area of interest and expertise on their part. They have taken on a tremendous amount of responsibility. In, and then in terms of guaranteeing clinical uh, rotations, they hold state contracts to staff various diversion programs in the county. So you know that piece has, is um, something that came intact to the consortium. And um, I don't know if anyone saw our sheriff on, um, on 60 Minutes recently, but we're able to do this work because he's really sort of created a safe space. He has a clinical psychologist running the jail. He says, I'm supposed to be running a correctional institution, not a mental health institution. You guys need to get it together. I don't need people who have of substance abuse and mental health problems in my facility. You guys figure it out. So in terms of our consortium, we've now had three cohorts. This is a nine-month commitment. Sometimes the students are there longer. Um, we have, because it's uh, interprofessional, some of them require 20 or 200 hours of clinical exposure, some 900 hours of clinical exposure. So. Sometimes you're there a little more than nine months. Um, TAS provides um, supervision to the extent possible. Obviously, some of that resides with the individual programs and universities, but they do have the capacity to provide clinical supervision. This gives you an idea of who our trainees are. Um, you know, the numbers have bounced around. We've had master's level and doctoral level trainees in a variety of different programs. So this, is, this slide talks about who the clients are. So you have to be, in order to qualify for, for task services or diversion services in general, it has to be a nonviolent offense. Um, it, it can't be your first offense, which kind of goes to um, something we talk about on the street in Chicago where we talk about how people catch a case like you catch a cold. And so we've kind of codified that in our approach to um, recidivism where if it's your first offense, you cannot go into a um, diversion program because, like, who knows why that happened. You could have just been the wrong place at the wrong time. And then, yes? And then it's not... Judy, hi, this is Alex. Um, I just wanted to see, because of our timing, if you would be able to jump closer to your recommendation slide towards the end. I think that's oh, really sure. insightful. People can, yeah, and people can look, at, can look at these slides. So um, I do want to say that this year the students took on for their policy project Lely's Law, which was the law I mentioned before. And they came up with two recommendations. One was um, expert training in primary care settings because they um, felt like the prescription monitoring piece was punitive towards prescribers and would relate to or result in um, uh, sort of stigmatizing people who ask prescription and profiling them. And then also they wanted to figure out how you would do this mandatory education for drug court personnel. So those are the two things that they carried forward. You know, TASC is in a position to have some input into these things because of their status in the state, and um, we're, you know, going on forward. This is, in general, a recommendation, uh, not just around opioids, but in general, that, you know, you have to have a partnership that's standing 
to really do IPE, you have to have the students deserve more than a two, three hour um, exposure to IPE. And um, to really consider it for your organization and act a long term commitment to work in these kinds of partnerships and bring the students together in this kind this way. And that's the end. <laughs> I've never done this before. <laughs> well, you did terrific. Thank you so much, Judy. And I know Karen didn't present, but she was there with you and put together the material, so we want to thank oh, her Oh, yes, as well. yes. I know. She was having some kind of trouble with whether or not uh, people could hear her, because um, we're not in the same building, of course, you know. That's understandable. Uh, so let, me, let me take the opportunity to, uh, to turn to our next speaker. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn to Constance Van Egan who's going to talk to us about implementing op opioid reduction policies in Vermont and her work with the AHEC program. Connie? Thank you. Alex, can you hear me OK? Alex, can you hear me? Alex? Connie, if your phone is on mute, uh, we ask that you go ahead and unmute that, please. Um, uh, let's see. This is the operator. If you're trying to speak and we're not hearing you, can you hit star zero? Because you may not have dialed in with um, the host code. All right. Um, who are you speaking to? Uh, Constance Van Egan. Oh, okay. So not me yet. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to bring Connie on in a minute. She's going to have to dial back in, um, and we'll get you in as a speaker. Connie, just let the operator know. In the meantime, um, we're going to ask uh, Suzanne Bailey and, and Mark McGraw if you could uh, present on the really innovative work going on at uh, Cherokee. So um, thanks. I know you were expecting to go after Connie, but um, let me turn it over to Suzanne and Mark. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. Suzanne Bailey. I'm the Director of Integrative Services at Cherokee Health Systems. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Mark McGrill, our Director of Addiction Medicine Services. Cherokee is both a federally qualified health center and a community mental health center. We have about 23 brick and mortar sites spread throughout East Tennessee from the mountaintop um, town of Clarefield, Tennessee, all the way to Memphis. And really our focus, our model, and our mission is integrated care. And this is our model and our mission because we recognize that primary care for decades has really been the primary venue for the provision of behavioral health and substance misuse treatment. So we are very focused on developing a model of care that provides access to those needed treatment services where patients show up, and then really focusing strategically on workforce development and training in an integrated model to build the workflow for these very needed services in our country. So what you see on the slide here is a definition of integrated care that we have adopted here at Cherokee as really exemplifying the model of care that we're providing. You can see it was written actually by CJ Peak and the National Integration Academy Council. And I, I highlighted some of, I think, the really key components of the model, that the, the care that we are providing um, results from a practice team of primary and behavioral health clinicians working together to provide cost-effective, patient-centered care for a defined patient population. And we offer this care using an integrated team-based model. So the functions of that care delivery are shared across the multidisciplinary team. And one of the key components of the model is providing immediate access to behavioral health expertise where those problems present. 
So um, really what we are working to do is not only screen all patients who seek care in our clinics for behavioral health and substance use problems, but when they screen positive, they immediately have access that day to see a psychologist member of our primary care team and then access care within our addiction medicine clinic because we know that that access is so critically important. And by bringing these behavioral health and addiction medicine services to primary care, we have significantly improved the communication and care coordination for some of our most complex patients that have multifaceted needs, medical, behavioral health, and substance misuse. And it's allowed us to really expand the care team for patients and the health management and patient engagement support for our patients. So what we have done is develop a behaviorally enhanced healthcare home throughout our primary care clinics. And Dr. McGrell is going to share with you specifically how we've adapted our behaviorally enhanced healthcare home to be an addiction medicine home. Some of the key components of this model is we have a behaviorist on the primary care team. It's really not specialty behavioral health care. In fact, as someone with um, significant clinical interest in both health psychology and substance misuse treatment. I really love this model because it allows us to treat patients with substance misuse concerns that would never present in a specialty behavioral health clinic, but they will come to primary care. So we're bringing the expertise where they show up. We also have a consulting psychiatrist as well as Dr. McGrail, the addiction specialist on the primary care team who can both see patients consultatively and provide care, as well as providing consultation and guidance to the primary care team to enhance their skills and capacity to manage the pathology that we know so commonly presents in primary care. Um, hey, uh, this is Alex. Suzanne, would you mind speaking up just a little bit for folks on the phone? Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, so we share the same patient panel and population health goals, the same support staff, physical space, clinical flow, and the same electronic health record. We don't work in silos, so we don't want to document in silos. Um, and so we are providing co-management and care coordination for the entire primary care panel. Okay, uh, thanks, Suzanne. Uh, I'll, this is Mark. I'll uh, uh, pick up our presentation from here. So, you know, clearly, you know, I'm gonna the, the statistics support that, you know, this was the this was the right time for Cherokee to adapt its integrated care model uh, into the uh, provision of addiction medicine services. Uh, I'll highlight the last two bullets. Uh, you know, if based on the, the 2015 survey, if we look at, you know, what Cherokee does well with integrating mental illness and now uh, addiction care, you know, the, the statistics are dismal. Only 7% of patients who suffer from both uh, diseases get care for both. Uh, clearly, you know, a, a, an opportunity to expand treatment to this patient population. And then if you look at the bottom bullet of a large primary, sur primary care survey, published in 2012, you know, one in 20 of patients walking through the door are suffering from, you know, what was then alcohol dependence, now an alcohol use disorder. You know, if you, if you think about that and compare that with bullet number three, that about only 10% of patients with a substance use disorder receive treatment, you know, if one in 20 patients walked through the door with breast cancer, but we said only 10% were going to get treatment, you know, that just would not be acceptable. Uh, so we have to look at substance use disorders in that way. So what Cherokee did was, as Suzanne mentioned, is we, you know, decided that, in, you know, we would integrate addiction medicine into our integrated care model. You know, it did take some, you know, obviously some effort to get there, you know, both from, you know, a personnel side, we had to hire additional staff, reallocate some internal staff in order to be stand, to stand up this new uh, clinic within the organization uh, that required some logistical, uh, you know, renovations and, and, 
and modifications to the facility. But I'd like to highlight the last two, and that's training in our in our clinical practice. You know, within two weeks of my arrival, and I was presenting a, a organization-wide continuing med medical education event uh, to the staff regarding uh, the treatment of substance use disorders, and in particular, medication-assisted treatment, uh, since that was going to be brand new to the organization. You know, we realized it was critical that not just the primary care staff, but all of our staff have an appreciation uh, for what it means to provide MAT, who are appropriate patients, how to get patients into our service, uh, and, you know, being able to uh, just really get the entire staff on board as we provided this service to our patients. Clearly, we had to also have some providers who could uh, obtain an X number, and we had to have that training. Uh, we currently have three providers in the organization uh, who are, do have X numbers and can prescribe. Um, clinically, we had to uh, basically, you know, start from scratch. Luckily, there are a lot of good resources out there, multiple websites, some of which you've heard about in this presentation. Uh, but we had to develop some templates for our electronic health record, you know, consent forms and treatment agreements for buprenorphine, our protocols on how we would, you know, conduct, uh, you know, uh, medication-assisted treatment, and then make sure, you know, that all staff felt competent and comfortable uh, with what we were doing, everything from, you know, being able to provide the medicines, giving injections, doing urine drug screening tests in, in, within, you know, in-house. Uh, so, you know, it, it took some effort to get you know, I think where we are now, and, and I'll be the first to admit it's, a, it's an evolution still. We, we continue to adapt and, and refine our processes. As Suzanne mentioned, we've taken the medical home approach to our addiction clinic. As you can see there, I won't you know, review all of the roles for each individual, but we, uh, every morning, much like a patient-centered medical home, we hold a team huddle uh, and all of the individuals on that on that list attend the team huddle. We can review the patients for each for each day. We you know kind of get get a game plan, review treatment plans. You know, what are we covering with our IOP that day? Who's coming in to get you know refills? You know, who's been struggling lately? What we can do to to increase you know services to patients? Uh, so all those people get together. We do a huddle every morning, and then we can also you know, select uh, staff will then kind of convene at the end of the day and figure out, you know, a quick uh, discussion for the next day and then what, what we did that day and, when, and how we can improve services. Uh, finally, some, uh, some training opportunities. I'll let uh, Suzanne discuss uh, the first several and then I'll, I'll make a comment uh, uh, as we wrap up. So consistent with our integrated approach to care, we really take an integrated approach to training and workforce development. Unfortunately, although there's increased recognition that integrated models of care produce improved patient outcomes, most healthcare providers still train in silos. So from a training perspective, we're really trying to knock down the silos and to train multiple different disciplines of healthcare providers in this model. So we have an APA-accredited internship as well as a postdoctoral fellowship in integrated health here at Cherokee. And we also offer training to organizations throughout the country. In fact, we have had organizations from all 50 states and several other countries come to our training academy and our behavioral health consultant training academy to learn about integrated care models and training and the boots on the ground skills, competencies, processes that are needed to develop and sustain these models. And for future directions, Dr. McGraw is going to talk about our fellowship and residency ideas. Yeah, as Suzanne mentioned, uh, Cherokee's uh, well established as a leader in psychologist training, but one of the areas that uh, has not been as robust is uh, in particular physician training. So recognizing that we need, you know, we need to get in with particularly primary care uh, providers as early in their training as possible. You know, addiction professionals will not, you know, just like behavioral health, the 
you know, addiction and professional psychiatrists do not provide the bulk of that care. It's done in it's done in primary care. So we need to reach these providers as soon as possible. Uh, so we've submitted uh, to the University of Tennessee system a fourth year medical student elective that will be added to their catalog, uh, particularly focusing on integrated care and addiction. Uh, we're in discussions with uh, the fam local family medicine residency on expanding resident opportunities. And then as we look forward internally in the organization, uh, we're very, uh, very interested in establishing perhaps a, a fellowship opportunity for physicians that could, you know, again, expand the training for a primary care provider uh, in uh, integrated care and addiction medicine. Uh, so we can start to improve uh, improve those capabilities and scope uh, within the primary care community. And uh, I think that's all we have. Thanks for your time, and we'll pass it on. I don't know if we're going to go back to Vermont or go to New Mexico. So. Yes, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you so much to you and Suzanne. We're going to go back to Connie. I believe she was able to uh, to call in. Connie. a really great overview. I am a fan of Cherokee Health Systems. I've had uh, worked with many organizations that have benefited from the work that you've done and, um, and I'm be partnering with you on this presentation. Um, but in addition, and thank you for your patience, I'm calling in from Burlington, Vermont, which is in the top left-hand corner of a northern New England state. And uh, we too have addiction issues, as uh, we all are on, who are present here on this uh, phone call have experienced. And I want to, um, I want to uh, give, give a chance to um, say, say thank you to the interprofessional group that's been working on this, sort of as uh, Judith was saying earlier, it takes a group of people in order to make um, a solution to this kind of problem happen. I work in the Division of General Internal Medicine Research in the Larner College of Medicine in close partnership with the Office of Primary Care, which manages the Vermont AHEC program. And Charlie McLean um, is a primary care physician who is um, a, the director of that particular program. Um, I am, sorry, I am looking for something that I just dropped. There we go. And I, um, and in this, uh, we've been sponsored through several different kinds of efforts uh, with the uh, Department of Health in Vermont and the uh, uh, Center for uh, uh, Communicable Diseases Center to try to figure out how do we create an eco ecosystem where providers in Vermont can work together and change the way they approach um, opioid prescriptions. Now, opioid prescriptions isn't the only problem, as Dr. Kampen Piano, if I got that right, pointed out from SAMHSA. Um, our goal is to think about how to look at the entire opioid problem, and we start that by thinking about education, very much as Illinois is doing. How do we understand what our uh, learners need to, under, need to practice differently? Uh, but we go into quality improvement in the primary care clinic in order to take that knowledge and turn it into changes in practice. And then we've been working in addition to that in extending our reach, our reach, which means not just working one practice at a time, but working in groups of practices and extending the training and education necessary for many practices to change the way they actually deliver care around opioid prescriptions and related opioid misuse problems. So to do that, we wound up building a toolkit, and that's the focus of this particular presentation is what is this toolkit and how does it help primary care practices make changes? Um, you're all familiar with increases in opioid sales, that's people writing prescriptions, deaths, similarly to sales has gone up, and treatment admissions per 10,000, and this is a national data. In Vermont, we have... Oh, uh, hey Connie, Alex here. Um, we're getting some requests for a little louder on your presentation. And let me move myself a little bit closer. Thank you very much. That's better already. Any feedback if I'm not loud enough? Um, no, that's perfect. Thanks. Okay, good. Um, so in Vermont, uh, as in other places in the country, our young people are using opioids. This is non-medical use of prescription pain relievers. And in this particular period of time, we found that although we have 12 to 17-year-olds, we have a larger than 
average uh, percentage of young adults, 18 to 25 year olds, and we wanted to figure out how to target uh, our, our messages not just to the um, adults but to the younger population as well and how to help our, our providers think about what we will do with this. Um, these are Vermont deaths and they are total opioids is the, are the light blue bar graph. So they have been going up. We saw a dip in 2014 and we attribute that to some degree to wise prescribing. We started this project back in 2011 and have been working practice by practice and system by system to help people think about how to change prescribing. But in the course of the most recent years are bigger problems as Dr. Campapiano said is not so much prescriptions, but in un, un, non-prescription use of, of opioid. Um, so we began to think about what, what's that mean? What are we going to do differently? Uh, we have been educating providers since 1999 through academic detailing, going practice by practice and bringing new knowledge. We were able to expand that effort over time and say, how can we reach deeper and farther and go back and help reinforce what providers themselves say they need to know? And to do that, we took an approach to quality improvement, which is a workflow-based approach, um, similar to microsystems. It's called Lean. Those of you familiar with Toyota production systems know that Lean is a product of an automobile manufacturer and is applied in many healthcare organizations to change the way practitioners uh, deploy what they need to do to how their clients, their customers, their patients need to receive that care. And then we created a program to train people to use those methods, and we came up with something we called these QI toolkits. These toolkits are real documents. Um, we have two different versions of this particular toolkit, which is about opioid prescribing. And um, I've got pictures of them on the left and right, but to find actual documents themselves, you'll want to go out to the website for AHEC, which is at the top of the last slide of this set. There's a resources page, which I'll touch on when we get there. And it'll show you how to get to these uh, recommendations for prescribing opioids uh, for chronic pain outside of certain conditions like cancer and palliative care. The images that I have here are two different toolkits. The one on the left is just the here's, like if you don't have a lot of time and you just want to know what are those best practices that prescribers use in order to change the way their prescriptions affect uh, their patients. The one on the left is one to look at. It's a little bit shorter. The one on the right goes through the lean management process of saying, how do you integrate what you think is the right thing to do in your actual flow of work? And how do you involve everybody in the practice in order to do that? And I'll be providing more examples of some of the strategies and tactics in the toolkits um, in a couple of slides. But this was sort of the place we came to, that we needed a way to disseminate this information across the state that was also an implementation tool. And that's why it's called a toolkit. It's based on CDC guidelines. Uh, we actually created the toolkits before the CDC guidelines were published, but nicely they go together beautifully and we didn't have to make any changes to it. We're really pleased about that. Um, the product of this two years worth of work was um, a 10 practice pilot study that then got disseminated across the state through the Department of Health activities. Uh, this is a condensation of those guidelines that came out in 2016 using alternatives to opioids whenever possible. I noticed in the slides that this is a, um, a group that's very interested in interprofessional based care and the alternatives to opioids includes physical therapy and includes uh, complementary and uh, supportive medicine and is um, part of what every, every prescriber can think about uh, when they're trying to help a patient manage chron chronic and um, hard to manage pain. Um, explaining the risks and benefits, including getting fully informed consent, focusing on function, what you can do as opposed to just what you feel, starting low in terms of prescriptions and going slowly forward, tracking progress, and avoiding benzodiazepines in con the context of pain management. I know that's not always possible. The, um, uh, the project itself that we did using uh, the development of a toolkit was in response to this public health problem, but it was also in response to a strong need expressed by primary care providers that they had to know, so what are we supposed to do that's, dif that's different? 
it isn't just knowing about what to prescribe, it's knowing how to manage this prescribing to manage the care in a step-by-step -step way that will help us all in our office know what to do. <clears throat> the, the reality of opioid prescription management is office disruption where the care is not meeting the needs of what the patient perceives is needed and the conflict between what the provider or the office thinks is the right thing to do and the patient is the thing that needs to be managed. How do we bring those things together? And so we decided we needed to focus on implementation rather than education. So this particular approach was funded by the Department of Health, piloted, tested, continues to be tested, and is now a facilitator training program. So what are some examples of that? The toolkit's broken up into two pieces. There's some things that you can only do if your entire practice says, yes, this is a good idea, we all want to do, to do this together. But there's some strategies that you can use that the provider simply, the person who's writing the prescription says, oh, I choose to do it this way. Not all practices make the decision to embark on a change of care together. Some providers are very much organized around, this is the way I was taught, this is what I'm comfortable with, this is, um, I, I want to approach change very slowly. So we ask, pra ask practices to start with thinking about practice-wide examples, particularly if they are willing to use as a practice a consistent approach, for example, a universal precautions approach where anyone who has an opioid prescription is going to be treated using the same standard approach as opposed to saying, I know Mrs. Smith very well. I know she would never use, misuse opioids. I don't think she needs to be included in this protocol. That is a really important decision for a practice to make. So is deciding whether or not the entire team, from the person at the front door, the person creating schedules, the person rooming the patient, the person taking vital signs, all those partners are important in developing a comprehensive approach to managing opioid prescriptions. And then something like, do we wish to see our chronic pain patients on a regular basis regardless of whether they call us up for something other than a refill? And the answer to that sometimes by saying yes means a completely different approach to helping that patient manage chronic pain. So those are a couple of examples. Uh, Provider-based example, uh, uh, Vermont Prescription Monitoring System is actually now a law in Vermont. This is our PDMP, our Prescription Data Monitoring System. And, um, and it is something we now require everyone to check, and I'm sure that's becoming more popular. Uh, but now we have systems for saying, how will that happen? Who will do that? When will that happen? Who will write the results down? Where will those results go? How will the provider know about it at the time that they actually meet with the patient face-to-face? -face? That's part of this project, too. Prescribing in multiples of days, no longer going with 30-day intervals of prescribing, but going with 28 or 50 or 84 as methods of making sure that the practice never is in the position where it's trying to refill a prescription on a weekend or with a covering provider. And pre-printing prescriptions for future use. Why do you just print one at a time? Can you print several at a time that are, have sort of a delayed reaction? Um, that works in Vermont. That might not work in other states. We worked with uh, some New York practices that had laws that prohibited that particular strategy. So you have to look at these strategies and understand that they aren't necessarily the same in every state. They are just certainly worth discussing in every practice that wants to think about how do we manage this important substance. Hey, Connie, uh, this is Alex. Could you run through these two slides a little quicker and then maybe get to those reference materials you wanted to end with? Sure. Thanks. The um, outcome of our pilot study, the way to look at this is the blue is the before, the red is after, and up is good. So in satisfaction, everything went better. In adherence to policies, having a roster, using agreements, everything went up. Being Increasing confidence in agreements, drug testing, especially in prescribing opioids, everything went up. So a toolkit approach really works. That's what this particular graph tells you. And as a result, we have this presentation. This is what you'll see when you go out to the website, and you can click right on those icons, and they'll give you those toolkits. And they match entirely the CDC documents that are the checklist that CDC provides for prescribing opioids. It's essentially the same information. The one on the right was mailed to prescribers individually. The one on the left came to us through the Department of Health and through um, institutional patterns. Doesn't matter. Both are good. Both are compliant and, co and consistent. And these are the resources. The top one is the one that you would want to use for accessing the toolkit. And that's it. That was terrific. Thank you, Constance. Really appreciate that. I'm going to turn to Helene, uh, who's going to tell us about what's going on around 
combating the opioid epidemic in New Mexico. And first, let me remind the audience that should we have a few minutes at the end, you're welcome to type in questions and we'll see if we can answer at least a, a few of them. And also, uh, you'll see on the lower left side of your screen, there are a series of files that you can open up um, which will give you some of the terrific resources and tools we've been talking about um, as well. So with that, I'm going to turn to Helene. You may want to check your mute button. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, operator. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. thank you. Okay, great. Um, let me start again. So thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak with you today. Uh, some of our uh, uh, partners uh, in the past are online today, and I learned from you last time, and I'm learning even more from you today, including uh, people from the Cherokee Health System, as well as uh, learning a lot from the people from Vermont. So thank you so much for that. N uh, I also don't have access to the buttons to change the slides, so I'm going to ask you to move the slides, please. Um, New Mexico is a very rich state in many ways. It's beautiful, it's diverse, it's full of extraordinary landscape and art. It has a great outdoors and a great uh, um, sense of pride in our state, but we are very large. Um, if you could just go back to the earlier slide, please. The state of New Mexico is so large that it's actually about the same distance driving from one part of the state to another as it takes to drive from uh, Washington, D.C. to Boston. There you go. And you can see on the map to the right that we have our AHEC programs, divide, our AHEC centers um, are all part of the New Mexico AHEC program. And you can see that the geographic area served by each of our AHEC centers is really quite large. So as a result, we've had to be fairly innovative in how we um, use resources and how we're nimble around seeing what we can uh, share with one another and combine with larger scale telehealth use as well as community-based programming. New Mexico is a poor state so we are not resource rich, but we are certainly passionate and, uh, about our state and we're rich in ideas. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? So uh, our, we are, our source of shame in many ways is that we consistently rank in the top three states. Uh, go back to background, please. Uh, we consistently rank in the top three states for the highest drug overdose rate. We consider it uh, an accomplishment this year, we're ranked number two instead of number one. Um, and uh, one of our major focuses has been how to work with providers, as our other colleagues have mentioned, to work with um, providers around the state to treat chronic non-cancer pain um, and to bring evidence-based practices in the community since we're talking about a consistent aspect of, of uh, prescription opioid dependence has to do with pre prescribing practices. Um, a major effort, next slide please, that was made through an unusual partnership is something I want to focus on first. It's called the HOPE Initiative and of course it has a clever, clever acronym, um, Partnering to Improve Health uh, is, is what we are up for and it is an extraordinary partnership between the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center and the Department of Justice. Uh, next slide. The, this partnership between the University of New Mexico and the Department of Justice really allows both groups to have a much broader vision of what they're able to do. Um, and we have been able, because of this, to really focus on the goals of the HOPE project, focusing on prevention and education, treatment, law enforcement, uh, reentry into the community, and strategic planning by really expanding the number of community groups that we are able to work with. And some of these include um, working with other hospital systems, working with county health councils, with the Indian Health Service, with federal granting agencies, with state licensing boards, uh, other community-based groups, including um, active mothers groups, active fathers groups, um, 
Um, and also, maybe, uh, maybe not necessarily more curiously, but working within, within our own institutions where we also are trying to undo the silos that allow several agencies at once within our institution to work on, on the um, opioid addiction problem and pain treatment issues. Um, uh, next slide, please. So our focus primarily has been to look at broad initiatives and then looking at specific outcomes and specific targets. So the, uh, these particular initiatives that we uh, have focused on, including uh, the awareness of the danger of prescription opioids, the targeting of prosecution towards dealers and organizations as opposed to users, increasing the availability and use of naloxone across the board, and increasing awareness of other pain management tools in an interdisciplinary way um, we, uh, would mean not so much if we didn't also improve access to treatment in the process. Um, we have, in this regard, um, next slide, please. Feel that we can toot our horn a little bit in terms of some of the successes that we have made. Uh, we've advocated for all officers uh, to carry life, uh, naloxone, to carry life-saving medication, and this was recently uh, legislated by the state. Naloxone training is part of all officers require training and we are working with them in making educational videos for, for the, uh, um, for the uh, officers as well as for the um, inmates. We meet with, uh, governor, with governors, uh, and those governors include the, not only the governor of the state, but the governors of our 19 Pueblos and law enforcement officers to better understand how opioid addictions are impacting their communities so we can respond. We have a really uh, wonderful program with our pharmacy uh, students, and they have a group called Generation RX um, that works with the U.S. Attorney's Office, and, and they give uh, talks throughout the state in um, rural and frontier communities, in tribal communities, in urban uh, uh, high schools, in um, uh, fraternity houses to uh, talk about risk uh, ways to avoid the risks that they are facing as, as students and young people in terms and, and as well as older people in terms of uh, um, opioid use and heroin use. And this allows our students to get a much broader sense of what their role can be in the community. They see a larger role for themselves and it actually changes their sense of what they want to do when they graduate. Our AHEC program keeps, keeps data on this. Um, one of the more interesting partnerships has to do with the Office for the Medical Investigator, and which allows for us to provide real-time surveillance for opioid-related deaths. We've been able to um, set up expedited toxicological testing. We have embedded DEA agents in daily pathology rounds, and that gives us critical evidence that might help us understand better distribution chains of um, opioids and heroin, as well as um, cases that um, might represent illicitly manufactured fentanyl, which is a major issue across the country. Um, next slide, please. A major aspect of all of this work has to do um, with how do we reach people through telehealth. And one of the most uh, well-known projects that I would like to uh, share with you today is our project ECHO, which is Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. It is a project that was started um, by a gastroenterologist trying to treat hepatitis C around the state who noticed that there were no specialists who were comfortable prescribing and treating patients, prescribing accurately uh, and effectively and treating patients across the board, not only in a medication management way, um, with hepatitis C because in rural communities we didn't have any gastroenterologists. And he created this model, which is basically a consultation model. It is not, does not involve patient care, but it involves uh, a, a created problem-based learning to allow for uh, and the um, capacity of communities to be enhanced where uh, training and care-based programs 
allow for specialty allow for specialty care to exist in a rural model and in a, and rural communities. The experts at UNM can beam out, but they uh, are also learning from the rural providers because they learn what rural communities can offer. They learn what is possible in rural communities. Uh, next slide. So basically, the uh, next slide, please. The four principles of the ECHO model are listed below. And um, in addition, at this time to using uh, ECHO for hepatitis C, we have a very robust pr series of programs that addresses many issues that share knowledge, expand treatment capacity, which really results in better care for more people. Uh, next slide. One of the most important programs within the ECHO program is the pain and tele-ECHO clinic. And this uh, it tries to teach best practices, increase capacity and competency, learn about resources, and none of these really work without offering free CMEs. And that's, um, we're proud of that too. And so we are really able to, uh, to share evidence-based chronic pain health care um, through this telehealth system. If the, tele you know, uh, if the telehealth doesn't uh, work well, we use just the telephone. Next. Helene, this is Alex. If I could ask for you to move to some of your final slides, because we have some really good questions that have come in for you, so I don't want to lose the opportunity. Okay, great. I just, okay, so in terms of our chronic pain management and opioid treatment, what we do offer is a six-month curriculum, which, which I sent forward and which you can access. We'll talk about that. Um, we have, uh, next slide, please. The, we offer a Indian Health Service uh, telebehavioral health center of excellence that we have organized with the Center for Rural and Community Behavioral Health that also includes the tele-echo pain management program as well as ESPERT and free CMEs are offered there too. Next slide. I just have, okay, next slide please. So the basic model that allows us to connect the telehealth with our rur rural um, needs involves using our AHEX in collaboration with our Health Extension Rural Offices. This is part of an initiative um, at UNM which, which sets up a cooperative extension model where we have regional hubs where uh, university resources are shared with communities in response to what the community itself is telling us they need. These resources include access to health care, but they also include um, paying attention to training, working with community colleges, um, sending uh, um, uh, through AHEC, sending our students from community health workers to medical students, to residents in family medicine, nursing, uh, PA, pharmacy, uh, psychiatry residents. Everyone across the board is part of, collect, connects with these regional hubs that are part of the AHEC program. Okay, um, next slide. Um, uh, one uh, ongoing project that uses this health hub as a model is called the, the um, Hero Trails, and it's an academic detailing program, kind of what was spoken about before, um, where uh, no-cost uh, CME workshops are designed to meet licensing requirements, but also requests of community providers uh, all over the state. This is coordinated through our AHEX and the HERO hubs. Next slide. Um, our next idea was how do we combine ECHO and community academic detailing, and we just got a grant that will allow us to develop this model, the ECHO-F model, ECHO and practice detailing or facilitation. And our last slide um, looks at our response to the state targeted um, response which also will increase um, MAT providers, increase patients who get care um, through these partnerships. And HEROES and AHEX will be part of this model. Um, the last, um, last slide, please. So these are the web links that I would like you to know are absolutely, uh, I hope you, every one of you calls in 
Um, the first link is for the Project ECHO and the Chronic Pain and Opioid Management ECHO Pain System. In, if you go online to see this, you will be able to access the curriculum that we provide. It's a six-month curriculum on Thursday afternoons, New Mexico time. Um, but it also tells you how to sign in if you want to present a patient that uh, you would like to share with the group. Um, the HOPE initiative is, uh, has its website here. And then the Indian Health Service Telebehavioral Health Center of Excellence, which allows you to access uh, the Project ECHO program, but also a wide range of behavioral health um, trainings. OK, thank you so much, everyone. So um, thank you, Helene. This is Alex. And we have about five minutes. And I'm going to go first to Melinda. So if you could bring yourself back online. Um, quick question. We just want to go through these quickly. You had talked about PCSSO MAT. It's a, just a terrific training and education resource. Is it possible for a local AHEX to partner with PCSSO MAT to put on a training in their community for providers around opioids? Is that something the PCSSO folks would do? I think that's, that's a possibility. And um, probably the best thing to do um, would be to contact one of us here or let me see if I can get it a, get a good link for someone at PCSS MAT. I'm going to do that right now. But I think that, that would be a, a very powerful alliance to establish. You bet. Thank you. And, and Carl, I think you've put up the polling questions for folks. Yes. If you could do that as well while we're speaking. I want to turn to Suzanne and Mark from Cherokee. Just briefly, you know, care for older populations around substance use disorders. Do you take the same approach as you do with the general population, or are you doing things specific to their needs? Um, this is Mark. I, I mean, basically the same stuff. They still get uh, seen in our integrated care model. Now, you know, in full disclosure, we've had very few patients over the age of, say, 60 in the uh, addiction clinic. Um, but, you know, my approach to them, you know, just to keep in mind their, their physical health issues along with their uh, behavioral health and addiction issues and, and essentially the management is, is often not that much different. Thanks. And my, my final two questions here, um, I'm going to go to Judy first and then to, to Constance and ask you both the same question. What would you like to do next? You know, based on the work you've been doing in this area, where do you think you'd like to go with this? Judy? Well, we really want to figure out how to uh, pull community health workers into this. You know, um, again, in Illinois, we have, you know, the whole CHW thing is a little up in the air in terms of reimbursement. But we feel like there really is a role, especially because um, we need both people who have been incarcerated, but, but anyone who's recovering from an addiction, the whole thing about resources and connections in a community and connections to treatment um, and all of that is so important. Um, we have a lot of our students in this project who have some aspects of what's called a lived experience. and. I'm sure that'll be true among community health workers also. And they have a way of talking to people that physicians don't have. So that's one thing that's really um, we're thinking about in the short term, how, how to do that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to turn to, uh, to Connie as well on this one. Uh, Where would we you like to go? We are working with a, a national group of providers on taking ideas, many of the ideas that Cherokee Health Systems presenters put in about integrating behavioral health and primary care because really the issue is upstream of the prescription pad or uh, right. what somebody decides to do with the drug that they might or might not be supposed to having be supposed to have. Um, it's why are they there in the first place and how can we integrate behavioral health and primary mm. care together to work on that problem before it becomes a problem or as it is, as it's emerging. And we're uh, working on a fairly large grant, a uh, five-year funded project, in order to create a toolkit to help practices do that as well. Very nice. And then, Helene, if you're able to, to speak to this uh, in 30 seconds, what would you like to do next based on the work you've been doing? Uh, Excuse me. What I would like to do is expand the success and breadth of the regional hubs because they have 
uh, and AHEC hubs because they have been really the linchpins for our being able to increase access to training and access to care. Great. Thank you so much, Helene. I want to just uh, thank everybody for participating today. The turnout was terrific. The speakers were, were just excellent. The questions very strong. And I want to turn your attention to future webinars that the Bureau of Health Workforce will be sponsoring on topics of concern to you as primary care and um, training and education programs, building this kind of uh, treatment and health professions capacity. We thank you very much for your participation, and I thank the team here in the Bureau of Health Workforce for your outstanding work in putting this together. Thanks, everybody. This is archived, so you can listen to it in the future. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. You too. You have a great day.